So we've had, uh, thanks very much, uh, Steve. We've had three really great talks showing how new technology promises new avenues for monitoring and for understanding seabird biology. And in our final uh, talk of this session, um, Tim, who uh, really needs no introduction, um, is going to, I'm sure, be looking at the future, but also uh, looking back in retrospect at um, his 40 years plus of uh, research on um, SCOMA. I did that on the talk. If you didn't like the talk, you're sure it's on that one? Yeah. 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 I didn't learn anything about technology from Tim during the bit. <laughs> <laughs> You might think I'm going to talk about girls, I'm actually going to talk about cancer. If you're over 60, you'll know that bowel cancer is the fourth most common cancer that people can get, and it's on the increase. Not something uh, that we should all be looking forward to, but it's something we should take very seriously. How does the NHS deal with this? Well, until recently, they just waited until people turned up at a &E and uh, either they gave them an operation or they died. Um, and that wasn't terribly satisfactory. In the last 10 years, we've adopted a slightly more sensible scheme that's called monitoring, and it's a screening program which uh, is costly to set up, but provides an advanced warning and the ability to respond in a very uh, positive sort of way, so there's much less trauma in the system, and people lead uh, a better quality life, and it's had a dramatic effect on the way people um, age, I suppose. That monitoring is very important. Okay, we've heard a lot about dead seabirds today. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. At the beginning of my career, there was a massive seabird wreck in the Irish Sea. And massive uh, standards then, and at the time they thought there were chemicals involved, PCBs. When the birds were analysed, they were all found, just like the ones in today's wreck, uh, to be under grossly underweight. And when they analysed them, they were full of these PCB chemicals, and they thought that they were the cause of the mortality. It just turns out that another bird died, they metabolized all their body reserves, and the PCBs kind of were released into the system. Probably very little to do with PCBs. It was exactly the same as today's wreck, just persistent bad weather. Birds can't forage, they starve to death. But as I said earlier this morning, this wreck is, is even bigger. That 1969 wreck followed hard on the heels of probably the biggest oiling incident with the Torrey Canyon uh, went with 30,000 uh, dead birds. And it was because of that that Chris Perrins, who spoke earlier today, and David Lack, his colleague, decided that <coughs> something should be done. And both then and now, people care about seabirds. And what happened then was, that Chris initiated some PhD studies, including mine, um, to start to try and look at what, how, how seabird populations work. And it seems amazing now that in 1970, which was when I was about 20, we knew almost nothing about seabird biology. We know so much has been has made, made evident today, but then we knew almost nothing. And the remarkable thing is that much of what we did know came from SCOMA, from this guy, David Saunders, the first warden of SCOMA. And he had this brilliant idea of counting the seabirds on SCOMA. And that was really the beginning of, of sensible quantitative monitoring. And this is um, a graph um, of his counts of guillemots. So he starts in about 1963, the numbers are reasonably high. And then, of course, the numbers start to fall, and it's fairly obvious why they started to fall. That's the Torrey Canyon, that's the Irish Seabird Wreck. There's a little bit of a recovery, and then it kind of levels out at a, at a new low level. Chris initiates his PhD, and I'm given the task of sorting out guillemot uh, population dynamics. But in the aim of my uh, PhD to understand what determines the numbers, measure adult survival, age of first breeding, breeding success, chick diet, feeding rate, blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> a lot of stuff to do, but because we knew so little, it meant devising new methods, um, or devising methods to measure these things. So as Chris mentioned earlier, <coughs> when, when I started, you could go onto a cliff 
and count Gilgamesh, which is what David Saunders did. But what did a hundred individuals on a cliff mean? Was that a hundred pairs? Was that fifty pairs? Nobody knew. So I had to devise a method for figuring that out, which I did very easily. Um, it's pretty important to know that. What about measuring breeding success? My predecessors that had attempted to measure breeding success in Gilgamesh simply walked onto ledges, flushed all the birds off, <laughs> counted the eggs, went, yeah, that's hundred eggs, and then they came back in three weeks and did the same thing again. But in the meantime, you know, when they'd left, the dolls ate most of the eggs. So it was absolute rubbish. So we had to devise a, a much better non-invasive method of measuring breeding success, which means sitting in a hive for bloody hours and hours with a telescope trying to spot eggs. How many eggs are there in that top photo? Well, I could probably tell you because I've been doing it for a long time, but it's not dead easy. How do you measure survival? We have to figure that out as well. The one thing we just discover, uh, the girls are long-lived and you need a long-term study to figure things out. Measuring survival is not like, well, it's, it's risky. Look at that, I'm kind of dangling around on ropes, catching birds on the end of a fishing rod in order to put rings on so that you can find those rings again in subsequent years and record the proportion of birds that uh, survive from one year to the next. We've also done about 10,000 chicks so far. Most of the field work on SCOMA consists of uh, me training a field assistant and you need somebody that's absolutely conscientious, absolutely independent, who you can trust. Because I'm, you know, I'm based in Sheffield, I'm teaching undergraduates and doing other stuff. You have to take somebody down, train them enough to do it. They come to Sheffield <laughs> for a week or so before they go on to SCOA, and they are responsible for collecting the data. I go down two or three times, but you can't be there all the time. And they do, basically uh, spend about eight hours a day for three months simply looking for colour rings, looking for eggs, so on. That's what the field work consists of. We have a sophisticated data recording system. A few years ago, uh, we bought, we got a guy to make us a database. It's really uh, incredibly effective. We use a handheld computer, and you look through the telescope and you see a bird that might be blue green on one leg, red over the BTO ring, and you just tap it in. And if you've made a mistake looking through the telescope, the computer says, "This bird does not breed here." Are you sure you're right? You go, you go there, you go big, and you just accumulate the records like that. You get back to the uh, house at the end of the day, you plug this into the computer, and it all just goes into the database. There's about 10,000 individual birds now in the database. So it's a very sophisticated system. It means that we can uh, interrogate this database for all sorts of parameters, um, measuring breeding success, survival, and so on. So, what have we found out? Well, Adult survival, about 95% of birds survive from one year to the next, which means that they have a breeding lifespan of about 20 years. Our oldest birds on SCOBA, last year there were two birds that are 33 years old, and I think the record for guillemots anywhere is about 35, so we've got some good old birds. They don't start breeding until they're seven, as Ben said earlier. Immature survival is uh, very high. Some years, about half the young birds that fledge survive to breed, which is phenomenal. Breeding success, about 80% of birds rear a chick each year. And the chicks are fed, again, as Ben said, predominantly on sprats, you get about three a day. But as Ben also hinted, we do have these funny blips. So I remember in about 1980, suddenly they were just bringing in little grotty cod, which had 99% water. Rubbish, and we thought, this is it, it's all going to change. Next year, flips back to sprats. Last summer, not sprats, herring. So we might be changing. So that's what we're going to need to monitor things. As a result of 40 years of doing this, this would be, this would be sad if it wasn't true. We don't actually know quite a lot about how the population works. And the key to keeping numbers up is the survival, predominantly of adult birds, but also the young birds. We've also found that owl survival and has changed, has declined with climate change. So that North Atlantic Oscillation that was mentioned earlier, the greater the source of that, the lower the survival. That North Atlantic Oscillation is all about warmer, wetter, windier winters, which is why we have the wreck. And the forecast is that we're going to get more of those. We also know that survival is greatly reduced by oil spill obviously the wreck, but sometimes these events happening at a long distance from SCOMA. So this is data, this is survival on this axis, these different years, and the black dots are when 
It was an oil spill. And you can see those four points, four major oil spills. The adult survival was much lower. Now the interesting thing is, if you've just done counts of the colony, you can't detect these effects. There's much more noise than the counts. The survival data is a much more sensitive uh, assay of what's going on. This is where those um, oil spills occurred. One was Siempre, which was quite close to Scoma, and then others further down into um, <coughs> France and Spain. Why do they kill guillemots? Because the Scoma guillemots, that's where they winter. And we de de deduce that from a combination of a large number of bringing recoveries over the years, but also using the same kind of tracking that Steve's just told us about. So you need all these extra bits to allow you to build up a comprehensive picture. As I just said, um, counts only give you a relatively poor indication of what's going on in survival data is much better. Despite climate change, despite oil spills, the scope of population has actually increased since the mid-1980s. So, <clears throat> this is when David Saunders started, that's the Irish seabird wreck, and this is about when Ben started his PhD. So I did mine here when the numbers were fairly stable, and the logic of Ben's PhD was that he would do the same kind of PhD as me, but on an increasing population. And as you can see there, Gilmore's population on scope has increased at about 5% per annum um, ever since. You could say, if you were the funding body, if Gilmore numbers are increasing, why are we worried? Well, that increase is a relative one. But there's the same data that I've just shown you, it's plotted on a slightly different scale. But I hope you can see there's a kind of 5% increase. In 1930, I reckon there was 100,000 pairs of guillemots on scope. So there's been a monumental decrease in numbers within kind of living memory. How do we know that? We know that because in 1930, Ronald Lockley took some large format photographs of the WIC, one of the main colonies on scope. And these, the negatives for that were about this big, they're big, large format colonies. You can count individual birds, you can't see it on this composite slide that I've made, but you can count individual birds. And um, if you want a very crude index, if you've been to SCOMA, that fault along the middle of the week um, in 1930 was continuous with birds, several meters deep in places, but now there's still massive gaps. It's going to take a long time to fill. <coughs> So although the scope of population is increasing in the past, it was much, much bigger than it is now. It would be great to think that it might get back to that. There's a second reason why we should be continuing to monitor an increasing population. Again, it's been hinted several times today, scope is just one of a handful of UK colonies that's actually increasing. If you go to Scotland, it's a really sorry state of affairs. Um, climate change and overfishing, perhaps, has caused massive reproductive failure. Gillots are intensely social birds and they help to look after each other's eggs and chicks. If there are predators around and there's a little chick on its own, they'll say, come here, they look after it. One year on the Isle of May when food was really short, the birds were so stressed that they were actually throwing their neighbor's chicks off the ledge to minimize the competition. There's a strong analogies with humans here under extreme stress. The next year the food supply was a little bit better, they start being nice to each other again. But they, in Northern Scotland and in other parts of the UK, uh, food is, is short and birds are struggling. And the other colonies that I know of, Benton and the Far Islands are kind of doing okay. Scoma is just one of a few that's doing okay. And of course, if we ever get kind of improvement in the environmental situation, places like Scoma could be absolutely vital in repopulating some of these other damaged populations. So I just want to finish by having a, a hard look at some of the issues that I'm facing personally, having undertaken 40 odd years of, of Guillemot research and then discovering that my funding has been cut. So for years, the Countryside Council of Wales have funded this Guillemot project and then, as we heard earlier, that funding has, has been withdrawn. And the CEO of uh, NRW has said, in response to something that appeared in the press, 
that they would continue uh, to monitor Guillermo's scoma via JNCC. But whilst that's all well and good, the problem with that is that that um, monitoring simply means doing counts. And whilst count, if that's the best you could do, counts might be okay. But we know that counts are increasingly difficult to do on scoma as the numbers get higher. Counts provide only a crude indication of environmental change, and they tell you nothing about the causes of those changes. So it just seems a little bit ironic to me when there's a tried and tested system based on 40 years of work that for a small amount of additional money you get to have a very sensitive uh, method that identifies the causes and monitors things very closely. So it's a bit like the National Health Service saying, actually, we did have this monitoring program and it was fantastic. People uh, didn't die so often from cancer, but in fact, we're just going to revert back to waiting for people to turn up at the hospital. Finally, if we have to think about wildlife as a resource, then just a reminder, the Pembroke Trials are the most visited and the most important monitored guillemot colony in Wales. Lots of people come to Scoma. And they come, somebody said earlier it's puffins, not puffins. They come to see guillemot. <laughs> they come to see the spectacle of 20,000, even better, 100,000 guillemots. That requires lots of jobs, lots of money. And people care whether their natural resources are being properly looked after. That's it. I fantasised about there being 5,000 pairs of guillemots in Scoma. So the fact that there are 20 is great. Um, it would just be extraordinarily good and exciting if there was 100,000. Um, I suspect that even before, oh, I suspect that before the 1930s, there were even more than 100,000 pets. And of course, because we, we can't know that. I just think we're incredibly lucky having those handful of negatives from Ron Lockley that allow us to assess. But it's like just it's well known that he wasn't very good at counting. Those photos, I could count, you know, 80,000 individuals on the photos, and Ronald Lockley came up with a figure of 5,000. I think he was just head in the clouds. Or head down a pocket. <laughs> it's worth adding to that, there obviously were those sorts of numbers of puppets too. Yeah. Uh, there are enough old photographs to show that there were masses of them. There was that huge puffin colony on Grassland. Yeah. yeah, I think the overall abundance of seabirds on Scoma uh, was fantastic. I should just say two other quick things. We don't know why the numbers decreased. Uh, that could have been environmental change. Lockley speculated that it was oil pollution as a result of the war. A lot of traffic through the channel, that could have been the case. The recent increase in numbers on Scoma um, is probably a, as a result of an increase in small fish so uh, one of the things that Tom's colleague, Julia Webb, has, has looked at is the abundance of small fish in the RSC, and that has gone up. Now that could be a good thing, it could be climate change, but it could also be a bad thing, it could also be related to overfishing of big predatory fish, releasing small fish and increasing abundance. But we really don't know the underlying cause of that population increase. Yes. Um, no, it's a question I was going to ask you about earlier data because you know, clearly most of the modern monitoring you know, kids off just doing 60s and 80s um, but I was thinking uh, uh, and went to the question I asked earlier about um, fisheries going back 50 years, 50 years a century and more um, it's very difficult to get a handle on exact numbers and the exact population size of the various fish, the fish stocks but it's pretty clear that most of them were probably 90% or so greater than they are now sure. um, um, you, know, it, it, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to, to, to be, there may be a link with the number of birds, but ha has any work been done to try, you know, with the, the best data and best estimates, um, 
that you can make of fish stocks and of ad hoc bird um, population numbers. Has there any, been any effort to actually use it? No, it's a good point. Yeah, so it's a good suggestion. It might be something that we should explore. Do you have a question? Me? Yeah. Yeah, we should answer this. Oh, okay. Sorry, I keep my hand up. Okay. Right, final question. Um, do we know if there's much movement between colonies? Yeah, that's a good question. So Ben showed, it's actually that figure on the poster there, that that's our evidence that we, we understand the population pretty well, that we can model it, okay? And we model it, model it using those parameters that Ben listed. And one of the parameters, if you remember his list, was immigration and emigration. And that is the hardest thing to measure. And certainly some of our birds have gone to different colonies. Um, and we've had one or two birds from distant colonies. But because there aren't that many people monitoring Guillemot colonies elsewhere, you, you end up with a very spotty picture of that. But the fact that, that our model works so well when we don't include immigration and emigration tells us that immigration and emigration is probably not very important. And what we get in, we probably get out. But it's probably tiny, because most of our birds do come back. So interestingly, we've had colouring birds turn up at Mike Harris's Isle of May colony, which is on the east coast of Scotland, but only as youngsters. They go and have a look and go, oh, this is rubbish, Scotland will go back to Wales. And so that's, what, that's a typical pattern. Birds of three, four, or five visit other colonies, but most of them come back in three months ago. So I think it's a fairly closed population. Thank you very much, Tim. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of the afternoon speakers for another uh, fantastic set of talks. So uh, can we just give everyone a special